we're actually in a series, thank you very much, we're actually in a series that we started uh, entitled, um, look at that, he got me set up. He says it was kind of blended in the background last, last time. Uh, it's called Soul Control. Soul Control. How, how many know that wh- whoever controls the soul determines the direction of your life? And so uh, we, we talked a lot, a lot about this. You know, when, when, you, when you are conceived, literally at conception, your soul came, was born, came alive. It's, it's the, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And obviously those things begin to be developed in you as, as you, as you kind of grew up and were born and started growing up in the earth. But when you got born again, when you got saved, in that moment, the Holy Spirit made your spirit come alive. You became alive in Christ. That old, you were no longer dead in your trespasses and that old sinful life. And, and your spirit, your reborn spirit, we call it your spirit, man. Ladies, that includes you too. But your reborn spirit hungers after the things of God, wants more of God, wants, loves things like church, worship, reading the Bible, hearing, you know, good preaching, good, good, good singing like you heard today. Your, your spirit thrives on stuff like that, it wants to more intimacy with God. Your soul, on the other hand, has been used to doing things a certain way for a very long time. And so the Apostle Paul talks about this battle that takes place. Uh, we're not going to go into those scriptures. Last week we went into it more in depth in the last couple of weeks. But you remember he talks about, he says, I, I find this, this law at work inside of me that delights in the law of God. That's your spirit. I delight more in the things of God. He says, but, I, but there's this other law at work on the inside of me that's, that's doing warfare with, with, the, the, with my mind. And, and he says, it's, he calls it the, the law of sin that's at work. And so basically, there's this battlefield. Joyce Meyer wrote a book one time called The Battlefield of the Mind, where this takes place. And like we said, well, whoever controls the soul controls uh, the destiny of your life. Your, your, your spirit wants to go in one direction, after the things of God, more intimacy with God. The soulish part of you wants to go into a different direction, that lazy part of you, that complacent part of you, that unfaithful part of you, right? Right? And so, and so there's this, there, there's, there's this struggle. And so let me, let me do my, my little project here. So we talked about this. So the container represents your body. The water represents your reborn spirit. And, and we don't need to get into all the scriptures, but that really does, there, there are plenty of scriptures that talk about how water represents not only your spirit, but the Holy Spirit. And I got to be very careful because I got some on me last week. This blue is going to represent the Holy Spirit. This is what I want to watch. I want to show you what happens. I really, this is your mind, your will, and your emotions, your soul. So, so, so watch this. I really, if I would have done this correctly, I would have had the, this, this blue come in and infuse you, your life, who you are. You are a spirit. And, and then I, I would have had some electronic arm reach down and just, just kind of slowly bring your soul in to be saturated by the things of God, right? And that's called the renewing of your mind, right? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. So here, here's really what it, what it looks like. So the Holy Spirit comes in. Things start to change. There's some changes taking place on the inside of you. Paul talks about it like this. He says, there's some things I always want to do I never end up doing. I want to do it, but then there are some things that um, I do that I don't want to do. The other way around, I want to do, but I don't do. And he says, I find this thing going on on the inside of me. And so the result, we obviously said, was the renewing of our mind. The more we get ourselves in God's word, the more we meditate on his word, the Bible calls it being transformed by the renewing of, of your mind. Philippians, I want to turn two passages of scripture today, Philippians chapter 4, I'll turn there with you. I'm, someone says, well, what translation are we in? We're in, the, we're in God's favorite translation, which is the New King James Version. Um, I, Steve laughs because he and I argue about that. Uh, the, it's Philippians chapter 4. And then I also want you to put a finger there, and I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Philippians 4 and 2 Corinthians chapter 10. All right. 
So, let's do this. Can I get it up here? Philippians chapter 4. Okay, he starts off and he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, verse 7, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren. So, so he, he starts off, and I want you to notice that he says, be anxious for nothing. Let me break that down for you. Be anxious for no thing. No thing. Uh, can I, I want to ask a question right now, and here's what I want you to do. I don't need you to say it out loud. You don't need to respond. I want you to respond on the inside unless you feel like responding out loud. It has, has there been a thing that has shown up in your life that has caused you to feel anxious or nervous or worried that has kind of captivated your attention? In other words, is there a, is there a thing that has shown up? Some of you are looking at me and you're like, Pastor, it's not just anxiety. Like, I've moved into, we've moved into full-blown, 100% bona fide depression and stress. Like, I'm stressed. Oh, I'm stressed. Stressed out. This thing has me stressed out. Someone said one time, they said, stress is when you're treading water and someone throws you a baby. Right? Like, like that, that's stress. Uh, he says, but be anxious for, for no thing. I... Uh, when I was a teenager, my dad had restored for me a 1965 Mustang convertible. It was awesome. It was a beautiful car. It was, uh, it was white with di- black diamond tuck interior. Uh, it was completely restored. Um, but, but during that same time, I was, ta- I was with Taffy, and she was singing in the group, and I was the sound man for the group, and so I needed something to hold the sound, sound equipment in as we traveled around to different places. And so I trade it in, and right now when I said the word trade, some of you men are in the room, you was like, ugh. I traded in that 1965 Mustang convertible for a 1980 Ford Courier pickup truck with a camper shell. Um, and, and I can just hear the moaning and the groaning right now inside of some of your spirits right now. Like, what? What? Why? What? How? How? What? Did I say it had a camper shell? I did say that, right? It had a it had a camper shell. Uh, the guy I sold it to was a, a man who owned a Cadillac dealership in Pomona. Uh, he actually took the car and put it on a showroom floor, one of those car turntables, and he had it up in there in the window so everybody that drove down the main street there in Pomona would actually see that 65 Mustang convertible in the window going around and around, um, just like sticking its tongue out at me every time I went by there. My dad actually went to try to get the car back, but it was un- he was unsuccessful, couldn't do it. And uh, for, for several days, my dad wouldn't even talk to me. He wouldn't talk to me for about four days because he was actually literally afraid that he would say something that would uh, have a detrimental effect to our future and, and, and relationship together. Um, and I know some of you are thinking, well, Pastor Doug, you, you, just, you, know, you just made a bad deal. You got tricked. Um, but it was more than just being tricked. I was stupid. I mean, you think about Jacob and Esau. We, we always think that, you know, Jacob tricked Esau. And Esau made a bad trade. He traded his birthright for a bowl of beans. But it wasn't so much that Jacob was good at the trick as much as Esau was just stupid. Right? Stupid. And, and on that particular day, I graduated magna cum laude with honors from stupid university. But, but I had to do what the prodigal son did. I actually, when I was in the hog pen... <laughs> I actually came to my senses, and I, I thought, I'm going to work out my speech. I've got, got to get this right. And so I actually, worked out, this, I actually worked up a speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight and in the sight of Henry Ford. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son or something like that. And I, I remember going to my dad, and I just, I just poured myself. I said, Dad, I listen, I did not take into consideration what you had done to get me that car. Uh, he, he did it because I was born in 1965. Some of you are doing the math right now. It's not important. Stay focused. <laughs> And so he gave me, he gave me the card, and, it was, and then I, I, didn't, I said, Dad, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't stop to think about what that meant to you. And not only that, I didn't even ask you your opinion about it. I just did it, and I, I, asked, I asked you to forgive me. And my dad looked at me through those big, giant eyes of grace, and he, he just kind of swallowed real hard, and he said, Son, it's, 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 it's all right. That thing, 
It's just a thing. I want you to look at someone sitting near you and say, that thing, it ain't nothing but a thing. Now look at the person on the other side of you who's obviously your second choice and say this, that thing, it ain't nothing but a thing. It, 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 ain't, it ain't nothing, it ain't nothing, it ain't nothing but a thing. Hmm. Paul, Paul's talking about it. He says, hey, he says, uh, if you've got some things that have cap- captivated your attention, like oh, if you've got some things that have r- robbed your focus, he says, there's some things that you've been obsessing over that you ought not be obsessing over. And, and then he like switches it up. And he says, okay, if you really need to obsess over some things, let me give you some things that you can obsess over. So I'm, I want to read. I want to read this again. Uh, I, I want to read this passage out again, and I want you to. Uh, I, I brought a different version here. Uh, let, let's get it up here. I want to read it again. Start with verse number six. Okay, there it is. And every time I say the word, you hear the word "thing." I want you to say that word out loud. Okay, you guys working with me on this? All right. Be anxious for no, but in every. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Next verse. Finally, my brethren. How how many of you know what it means when a preacher says finally? Absolutely nothing, right? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are noble, whatever are just, whatever are pure, whatever are lovely, whatever are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is any praiseworthy, meditate, think on these things. Did did you get it? It's it's like he's um it's it's like he he's given us a a catalog of the good things of God. The the good things of God. Um I totally, you know, my, my sermon went away. Okay, I got it back. So then in, in, in verse number nine, he says, the thing which you have learned and received and heard of me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. And the reason why I love verse nine is because it, it, it sounds a lot like verse seven. In fact, can you give me verse seven again? Can you go back a couple slides there? At the end of verse number Seven, he says, and at the beginning of verse seven, he says, and the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse nine again, at the end of verse nine. And the God of peace will, will be with you. Verse, verse seven again. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Give me verse nine again. And the God of peace will be with you. Give, give me verse seven again. And they don't got it yet. And then the peace of God, which, give me verse 9, and the God of peace will, get, verse 70, you're almost there, you almost got it. And the peace of God, verse 7, verse 9, and, and the God of peace. Listen, I don't, I don't want to be bragging this morning, okay? But you want to know the reason why you can't steal my peace away from me? And again, this isn't a brag, okay? I'm not, listen, there, 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 there are times when I get bumped in a moment, in, in a moment of crisis. But I, I figured out if you just give me a little bit of space, I'll, I'll get right back in peace. And, and the reason why is because I, I've settled some things down on the inside of me. Like I've been meditating on some things. And I've got those things down in me now. I, I can do it better. There's some things that have turned blue inside of me. And they've gotten down on the inside of me. So that I can now say with confidence that I don't just have, (laughs) I can can now say with confidence, I don't just have the peace that God gives me. I have the God that gives me peace. Do you you get that right here? Are we tracking together this morning? I, I have the God that means on my best day I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child of God. 
The Apostle Paul said it just the one chapter earlier. He says, I, I don't, I'm not bragging. I don't mean to say that I've arrived at everything yet. Like, I haven't attained all this yet. But there are some things that I have pressed into. That there's some stuff that have turned blue in my soul. Like, this one thing I do, and that is forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the mark for the prize of, of the high call of God. What you got to know about Philippians 4 is it is not an exhaustive list. He, he's basically saying, let me give you some examples of the kind of things that, can, that you can embrace that you, that'll, that'll give you a healthy soul. I want to give you another scripture. You're already there. I had you turn to it. That I want to link these two passages together. And, and if you were just to read these two passages separately, you might think that they wouldn't go together. I'm, I'm going to try to do my best to make them sound like they really go together. And I'm going to show you why. It's like when I come in the room and Taffy says to me, you can't wear that. Like that does not go together. Like you cannot go to church like that. It doesn't work together. And I say, baby, it's because you just don't know how to rock it like I do. Like I, like I, got, I, got, I, can, make it, I can make it work. I can make it work. I can, I can make it work. So he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. So he's talking about that battlefield, right? Not the kind of battlefield that plays out on fields of dirt, but the kind of battlefield that takes place in the soul. Now watch this. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to, to demolish strongholds. Now, now why do we need weapons for our minds? Well, because if you've ever had thoughts that terrorize you, Thoughts of insecurity, thoughts of shame, thoughts of rejection, thoughts of inadequacy, failure, hopelessness. In other words, terrorizing thoughts. If you've ever had these, then this would be the verse that I'm going to point you to. That you need to feed your soul with. And he goes on and tells us why and how to do that. In verse 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What is that? That's any thought or imagination that contradicts what God says. And then he says, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So I know some of you are still struggling right now. You're wondering how these two passages sync up. In Philippians 4, he tells us, to think about and hold on to all those godly thoughts, those positive godly thoughts. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he tells us to take captive all those negative ungodly thoughts. In other words, we're supposed to hold both kind of thoughts just in a different way. I, I could do that better. It's one thing to hold a thought. It's another thing when a thought holds you. And he calls it those negative thoughts strongholds. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is a negative pattern of thinking that exaggerates the negative and leaves out the positive. It makes sweeping conclusions of truth based upon a truth until that pattern of thinking affects how you negatively see other people and circumstances. The only lies that can hurt you are the lies that you receive as truth. There, there are there, there's some women, maybe here in the room or watching online, who have been mistreated by a man. And what a stronghold will do is tell her that you better put up walls you better keep yourself guarded at all times because all men are bad. At the detriment of the good godly man that God's trying to bring into her life to bring restoration to her life and heart. And she might even venture out guarded, walls up. But eventually, because of the stronghold, 
that has taken hold on the inside, she, she's going to chisel away at the good parts of him until the bad stuff is exposed, the weaknesses, the limitations are exposed. And then the enemy's going to show her, well, see, I told you he's not a perfect man because all men are bad. It's not that he's so low, it's that she's elevated him too high. Do you get what I'm saying? Not yet, do you? You don't get what I'm saying yet. I've had people tell me, Doug, the reason I'm not involved in church is because I've had some bad pastors. Well, I've had some bad saints. What do you want me to do about it? You want me to stay mad? Stay discouraged? Throw in the towel? You want me to get up here every week and preach to you out of my frustration with them? Stop allowing your timeline to be determined by someone who's not even in your lifeline. Peter would never have preached on the day of Pentecost had he surrounded himself with people who kept bringing up his denial. Oh, come on, pastor, that's good. Preach it like that. We like it like that around here. You, you get that? Strongholds. For some of you, the fear of failure has a hold on you. For some of you, bitterness of what someone else did has a hold on you. For some of you, shame has a hold on you. But what Philippians 4, 8 describes for the good, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 describes in reverse. There are some thoughts that come from God that are good, that we need to actually be seeking out and, and, and searching for and, and then meditating on and embracing those thoughts. There are some other thoughts that are not from God. And they're the kind of thoughts that are trying to get a hold of you and hold on to you. And Paul says, when those thoughts come in, what are we supposed to do? Let them go? It's what we've always heard, isn't it? Just let it go. Do it Elsa style. Just, just let it go. Just, right? Isn't that what we always heard? And so you have this thing that happened, maybe traumatic, maybe horrible, horrible event in your life. Right? And you're doing everything you can. You're going to church, you're, you're, you're praying, you're worshiping, you're doing everything you can to try to get through that event. And then someone comes up, probably after church, someone who, who wasn't even there in your backstory and all of a sudden they're trying to be part of your highlight reel. And, and they come in there and they look at you and they say, what are you worried about? Just let it go. And they're probably eating a donut, jelly filled, right? They're, just let it go, brother. Just let it go. And then all of a sudden, you know, if, if you wasn't for church and the fact that you were in God's house, you know, you might do something, but, but at the very least, some other thoughts start to come up inside of you, right? And they're not wholesome thoughts, you know. Thoughts like, you know, may a thousand fleas infest your bed tonight while you sleep, right? And Paul says, how's that working for you? How's it working for you? No? No good? See, see, I found out that the thing about just letting it go is that it has a way of boomeranging, those thoughts. Like, like, like what you let go of today will go out and get seven more of its buddies and come back worse than, than before. And the thing you thought you let go of today will be the very thing that wakes you up tomorrow because thoughts have a way of boomeranging. So Paul says, you good? Is that how you wanna do it? No, maybe it's time to try something different. So how about instead of just letting it go, how about you take it captive?
What's he talking about? He's talking about setting up TSA for your mind, right? It's time to set up TSA for your mind. We got this scripture last week. We're going to close with this. Give it to me. It's in Psalm 42. David prays this. He says, why my soul are you downcast? Like you, you got to set up some interrogation in your own heart and your own mind. You've just been letting anything just bombard you and then say, okay, well, whatever, whatever, say, sirrah, sirrah, okay, sirrah, whatever shall, right? No, you got to get some interrogation going inside of you. He says, hey, soul, why are you so downcast? Why are you disquieted, disturbed within me? Right? Where did you come from, thought? Why are you in that mood you're in? Where did that come from? You look suspicious. I got a list in Philippians 4, and you don't look like anything in that list. You don't fit the description. So, hey, soul, why are you thinking this way? Put your hope in God. Put, no, 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 no. Put your hope in God. Come on, interrogate your soul. Put your hope in God. Amen. Bow your heads, close your eyes with me. Father, I just pray this morning that you will take this, this word that was, was sown into their lives today and just use it and just kind of just get it begin to let it incubate down on the inside that God you have you have placed maybe something that was said or sung has has nothing to do with what you're speaking to them about right now like right now it, there was a trigger in the message or maybe in the song service today but but you're just exploding something on the inside of them I pray that that wisdom revelation knowledge I pray that just just begins to rise up on the inside of them God I pray that they will realize that that we can put up we can put up reinforcements to, to protect us from, from everything the enemy wants to come and do on the inside of us. We can stop that stuff. We can stop that stuff. He told us to guard our heart with all diligence for out of it flow the, the issues of life. I pray God that you will just just, just speak to the hearts as Kevin just prayed. We, we, we want God to just move on the inside of people today move on them speak to them i pray father bring them out of that 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 season of depression or anxiety that they found themselves in lift them up i pray out of that miry clay set their feet upon a rock establish their going in jesus mighty name we pray everybody said amen want to look right there in the camera and just say if you have not received Jesus as your personal Savior, we'd like to introduce you to him. Right now, if, 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 you, if you feel like, like, like you, you need God in your life, that's, that's not because of the sermon. That's because the Holy Spirit is drawing you. Say this. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of unrighteousness. I surrender my life to you. I give myself to you. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Listen, we believe if you prayed that very simple prayer, you got born again right now. We have something we want to send you. If you're here right now, come see us afterwards and say, hey, Pastor Doug, that, I did that today. I did that. I, I surrendered my life to Christ. So thankful. We want, we want to give you some things to get you on your journey. If you're watching online, do me a favor. Click on the comment link. Say, Pastor Doug, that was me. I raised my hand today. I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. God bless you all. Hey, listen, did you enjoy Gateway Trio today? That was awesome. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Make sure you stop by their product table out there. Um, be a blessing to them. Also, uh, remember, pick up, uh, pick up one of those, some of those flyers for, for Easter. Put, put some, someone's name on it. Give it to them. Walk across the cubicle. Let them know uh, that you'd like them to join you for Easter celebration service. Anyway, God bless you. Do me a favor, will you please? Tell two or three people how blessed and glad you were to see them in God's house. God bless you.